Recorded at the Kitchen Studios. This is the Pencil Pushers Podcast. Welcome, Leadheads. You are listening to the Pencil Pushers Podcast, a place to chat about and revel in the love of the hand drawn arts. And as always, I'm your humble host, Mike Rosado. Today, I'm thrilled to present our chat with animator, writer, director, the very own Will Finn. Will is someone who I've had a beat on since I was a kid dreaming of one day being a Disney artist. Will has been one of the lead animators for some of the most beloved Disney characters, including The Little Mermaid's Grimsby, Aladdin's Iago, and everyone's favorite Cogsworth from Beauty and the Beast. But he's not just a Disney guy. Throughout his career, he's worked with animation studio giants Don Bluth, Chuck Jones, Warner Brothers, Boomerang, and more. I can't wait to finally dig in, so ease your seat back, relax, and let's chat with Will. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, uh, let's give a big round of applause to Will Finn. How are you, Will? Uh, I'm fine. Thank you, Mike. Thanks for having me on. I really appreciate it. Yeah, I'm so excited to uh, to dig in with you. Um, Initially, I wanted to be a Disney animator when I was growing up, and it started really when I saw The Secret of Nim. There was something about that movie that just not a Disney really movie. just <laughs> not a Disney movie at all. Nope, I was completely blown away by it. But that really turned me on to animation, and and shortly afterwards, the, I, I I became passionately trying to figure out how to become an animator. So how old um, were you was really, when that came out? Well, to be honest, the the movie came out was already out, so oh, I okay. saw. You saw yeah, it on, on I saw, video. I saw it on video, or it was on like HBO okay. or something like that, and it was uh, it was just it just blew me away. I mean, it still blows me away. I think it's an, like an incredible, incredible movie, mm. beautifully animated. But anyway, so that was kind of my my foray into animation, and then I started seeing all these behind the scene movies with all the Renaissance Disney Renaissance movies that were coming out with yeah. Aladdin and Little mm-hmm. Mermaid and. And you were one of the main guys <laughs> that I would always see in these well, documentaries. That, yeah, well, I wasn't in the top five, but I was in the top ten for about uh, a hot minute there in the history of Disney. I should hesitate to say this, but this is uh, I just passed the 40-year mark in, in my career. Uh, Congratulations. Uh, expanse. And um, I've worked 15 of those years at Disney, um, not consecutively, but... Right. That stretch during the Renaissance, which started in the late eighties and went to the late nineties. <laughs> yeah. Me. You're that, you're you were you were lucky to be a part of oh, that, Mike. I mean, do you do you go back and think about that? Do you think wow, I I, I was lucky to catch that last that last sort of gasp Absolutely. before I can't, it went into you know, CG. if I if I'd wished upon a star, as it were, I would not have uh, <laughs> hoped for things to go as well as they did because they didn't. Um, you know, I got out here in the late seventies, and the business was dead, and uh, looked yeah. like there was no uh, hope of any kind, at least not in in the U.S. And yeah. uh, you know, really struggled for ten years, and struggled with my own inability to um, figure out how to do it. Um, mm-hmm. So, but then when it hit, it was so unreal. It was, and I, I remember the the entire time thinking that this uh, won't last, Will, so enjoy it while you can. And it didn't. Yeah. <laughs> but well, uh, Were there any others that were kind of feeling that way too? I mean, or was it, I'm sure there was a, probably a mix of people that felt, uh, oh, this will last forever. And then some people felt, oh, uh, uh, you know, it can only last but for so long. Yeah, I, 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 I think just throughout my life, I've had a sense of uh, endings and, yeah. uh, you know, that all things end and, you um, which is actually a good thing, and um, that yeah. uh, things wouldn't continue. You know, even <laughs> when all that great stuff was going on, I left on my own accord to go work at DreamWorks because I was getting a little. I was starting to, uh, you know, there was there was becoming a sort of formulaic way of handling everything uh, yeah. at the studio because the success, uh, the difference between everything before. And up to Lion King was, I always like to say, is that, um, and this isn't just at Disney, but this was on Secret of Nim, this is on everything. Mm. The business was so uh, downtrodden, and it was such a struggle, and the people that were crazy enough to want to do it um, yeah. were all so like-minded that every job felt like a collaboration. 
Mm. And then after all the big success of Lion King and, you know, a string of huge mega hits in a row, uh, it, it went from feeling like a collaboration to feeling like a committee. <laughs> yeah. And because yeah. And there was so much pressure. it looks like the same thing. There was there was so much pressure at that point, and yeah. but but you know what I don't I don't want to jump into that yet because I really yeah uh, that's there's so much there's so much meat on that bone that I want to that I want to tackle because okay. uh, I'm so curious about that because well we'll, we'll talk about it okay. later but but you're talking about ends a minute ago let's talk about beginnings um, so you started. Um, I, I so I I was reading up on you and and apparently you you went to the Art Institute of Pittsburgh. Yes. Um, now you were going there for graphics art program. Well, um, they 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 had uh, um, in their brochure they had an animation category, but it really okay. they really didn't. <laughs> sure. I found out too right. late. If, yeah. if I had so known I, about Sheridan College in, in Canada, I would have gone there because uh, hmm. I grew up in Mid State New York, and it would have been the same distance to go to shift to Toronto as it was to go to Pittsburgh. But, uh, mm. I didn't have any awareness that there was another school in the, in that part of the country that taught animation, let alone one that was devoted to it. So yeah, I now for those who don't know Sheridan at the time, um, I'm not sure if it is still, but for those who don't know, Sheridan was a pretty much on equal footing. It was basically Canada's version of California Institute of the Arts, which was the quintessential animation. Uh, yeah, well, Cal Arts uh, is like the Harvard of, of uh, animation schools and still is, but yeah. but uh, I, I don't think Sheridan. I think Sheridan's you know a little not quite on the same footing, but it was the next best right. thing back in those days. Right, and uh, I, I I you know I really. Uh, there was a long time where I wished I had taken a different educational course, but mm -hmm. uh, I want I, because of things that we can either get into or not. I look back now and have no regrets about having gone to the art institute, even though they didn't have an animation program. Yeah, so I'm curious. You had, um, you know, I told you uh, via email um, uh, that I had a, a sort of a, 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 a mentorship. Um, relationship with with another animator, Phil Young, yeah. and uh, when I was a kid, and he was always pushing the emphasis of really learning the human form and and just mastering it. Um, was that so? So my question is: is like when you were going to try to get into Disney, did you already have all of that formal training and, uh, enough to? No. I mean, looking back on it now, did you feel like you had the formal no, training? No, no, okay. no, no. Um, I didn't. Uh, and then that is important. Uh, Phil w was absolutely right. And, of course, I know Phil, and he's a great guy. Um, yeah, uh, the importance in knowing the human figure and, and human anatomy and, and the mechanics of the figure. Um, really, my biggest strength as an artist was always – and I didn't know this until later, because um, uh, as a kid, I always drew cartoons. Mm -hmm. um, but particularly back in the 70s when they were starting up the training program, Disney didn't want to see cartoons. They wanted to see people who yeah. were good artists, period. Right. Um, yeah. And I was, but uh, when I was taking art classes and figure drawing classes in Pittsburgh, uh, I discovered that, that probably the, 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 the only real innate strength I had was for capturing gestures. Because mm, if we did long right. studies, I would usually louse up the drawing. But if we did like a five-second gesture, um, I would get it. the best uh, best result in the class. <laughs> yeah. um, so, Which is hugely important in animation. Yeah, it is. It's everything. It really is everything. And it's still to this day uh, the thing that fascinates me about uh, mm. drawing. Yeah. Yeah. So you – so you. Um, I believe what I had read is that you had – Eric Larson came to speak yes. at your school. Yes, he came to Art Institute, and that's that's where I feel like the uh, Art Institute turned out to be my saving grace because um, they, uh, they also had a very good placement program. They, they, they actually lined me up with a number of good employers, but I was really intent on getting into animation. So yeah. um, Eric came out in 78. I think it was April or May. And mm -hmm. he was. Were you just geeking out, by the way? Were you geeking out knowing oh that Eric God. Larson was oh going to be God. there? Oh my God! Of course, nine old man yeah. Eric Larson. And at the time, there was no pictures about these guys. You know, they were still kind of obscure figures. And there was a book that had just come out, Richard uh, about Richard Williams' uh, Raggedy Ann and Andy movie, 
um, oh, wow. by John Canemaker. It was a very good book. I've ne- to this day, yeah. I've still never seen that movie. But there was I, I looked at the index, and there was a picture of Eric <laughs> Larson. So I'll, I'll, I'll find this picture of Eric Larson. This is where you just want to <laughs> throttle an art director. He picked a picture where Eric is standing between Frank Thomas and Ollie Johnson, two of the other great nine old men. And Eric yeah. is... Um, his neck is at a 90 degree angle. He's looking down. So it's the top of his head. And it's like, I don't even know what this guy's going to look like. But I did get to meet him. And the thing was, the, the school, which even which actively discouraged people from trying to get into animation, uh, no one was it. There was like uh, one girl who was kind of, they talked into like taking a meeting with him, but nobody else was interested in talking to him. So for the entire what? four or five hours he was there, I was just all over him, like a you know, like a cheap yeah. suit, and uh, went to lunch with him, and just <laughs> you know, was just. And finally, he looked at my portfolio, and I was about five or six months away from graduating, and he said in his low, rumbling, volcanic voice, that you know, uh, he said that uh, he didn't think my portfolio would get me hired at Disney. Right. Um, this is, at this that is after you paid for his but, lunch, right? What's that? That's after you paid for his lunch, right? Then he told you that you were. <laughs> um, uh, we, uh, but he, you know, this is the great thing about Eric and why he was the perfect person to run that training program and why he was such a great mentor to so many people in my generation is he gave me hmm. exactly as much encouragement as I deserved. Hmm. Uh, because he awesome. said, you don't really, you know, I don't see it from your artwork. But having spent half the day with you, I can really tell you you are fired up about this and you're really sincere and you have a, a, a real genuine drive to want to do this. And yeah. that's, not the, that's not more important than the drawing, but it's almost as important. So yeah. here's what you should do. Uh, send me your final portfolio when you get done with school. I'll evaluate it then. But whatever happens, get out to California and get into the industry because that's the only place you're going to get animation training of any kind. And mm-hmm. he was absolutely good to his word uh, right across the board. I sent out my portfolio in. in uh, Did September. he give you any advice as to how to, you know, oh, yeah, really? Yeah, f- yeah. He, okay, was, he okay. was really he was very explicit, but I mean, he was going over specific drawings. So I, uh, I, I, don't, okay. I can't really verbalize it here. But what yeah. he did was. Um, Because my my final portfolio wasn't good enough either. But again, he reiterated in his letter, he said, just get out, you know, call me. Um, I'll be happy to look at your sketches anytime. So what I did was I got out here and I I ride shared and I couch surfed and I got a job (laughs) downtown uh, in, uh, I almost said that, I said like a Pittsburgher, a downtown. I almost uh, (laughs) went in my Pittsburgh East. Anyways, uh, so I got a job down town at a bookstore near usc and uh then every month or so i'd take my sketchbook to disney studio and uh which was very exciting and go into right. the uh, the original animation building and eric would go over my drawings and not not draw over them but he'd explain to me what was good what was bad about what he was doing and eventually i got again? hired this is 78 this is 78 79 yeah end of 78 okay. into 79 so i got out here in october 78 and then uh i got hired in april 79 okay walk me through this experience <laughs> uh well i, I mean I, what I, was it what was it like <laughs> stepping in there knowing that you're now an employee <laughs> at disney it was it was it was it was surreal um and it was um in so many ways because uh you know, we were so far from the Renaissance that was going to happen, and Disney was still sort of mired in the past. Um, uh, Ron Miller was still running the company, and the emphasis was really on the parks. I'll tell you, I'll tell you how mm-hmm. uh, how far the fortunes of the Disney Studio brand had fallen. Uh, that when I uh, finally got uh, a tentative hire onto the training program, I came to Burbank and I interviewed to get an apartment. And every little old lady in Burbank who was terrified to see this skinny hippie uh, on their doorstep, the landladies would not uh, would not rent me. And um, they, one of one, one, and I said, "Well, no, I I'm I, I, I'm going to work at Disney." And and th- right. th- they would invariably say, "Son, that's down in Anaheim. You don't want to. That's like that's forty five minutes away. You don't want an apartment in Burbank to work at Disneyland." 
And it's like they, <laughs> no, it's a Disney studio. It's like half a mile away. It's right down right. the street. And no, but I mean, there was nothing advertising wow. that of what it was. Yeah. It was a very inconspicuous place. It was right yeah. across, and you know, it's right across the street from the hospital, which I'm sure quite a few of those little landladies were very familiar with. Uh, but <laughs> they, they, people just didn't know. And I said, well, you know, they, they, they make movies like, you know, Snow White and Pinocchio. You've heard of those. And I said, yeah, but son, that was a long time ago. Oh, my God. <laughs> and they just didn't believe me that there was a studio and that they had made Rescuers and Robin Hood and all yeah. these recent movies. It's just they didn't they didn't they were on nobody's radar. So it right. was a weird thing. So but it was from an animator's point of view, it was very exciting to be there and to work with Eric and have him. What, what you did was if you got accepted into the training program, which I ultimately did, you had eight weeks to make two short pencil tests and base. Well, actually, right. you had four weeks to make one. And if, and if they liked the first one, you made the second one. Right. And then now can you can you just very quickly, very quickly, what can you just explain what a pencil test is for people who because oh. th this is we talk about all not just animation, but all kinds of sure. drawn. Uh... Uh, it's where you just photograph the uh, raw pencil drawings <laughs> one frame at a time under mm -hmm. the camera. And uh, there's no color. The drawings are still very rough, often very crude. But from the pencil test, you get the sense of the the animation. It's how you so how you see the animation. Yep. So yep. you know, it's it's a stack of drawings that you flip like a big flip book until you get it on film, and that's when it really officially becomes animation. Yep. And uh, so I got, so you had to do got two through of those. that program with Eric, and then got put onto production of. Uh, they were making Fox and the Hound. Was mm -hmm. the movie they were making, which was a. Uh, uh, it just—it seemed like such a step backward to me. Um, really, yeah. even even in production, you could oh. tell that that was the case. You know, the, the 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 actual finished movie is is a little bit better than than what was going on when I was there. Um, I didn't last right. uh, the whole year, uh, the first year time I, I was there, but uh, uh, yeah. It, it, so, and then in the middle of all this, um, in 1975, I'd read an article about Disney that was in the New York Times Sunday uh, Magazine that my sister had sent me. And it was all mm -hmm. about this training program where Disney was training artists. And I was like, well, boy, I got to be part of that. And uh, yeah. so this is 75. I'm still in high school. And mm -hmm. uh, the the, uh, the article was by John Culhane, who was son of Seamus mm -hmm. Culhane, a great animator. And uh, oh, he yeah. put all his money on Don Bluth. He interviewed Don Bluth. And Don Bluth was a uh, very charismatic, uh, up-and-coming animator. Don was... For the, the years of the training program, Don was really a senior artist because he had started as a cleanup artist on Sleeping Beauty in the 50s. Yeah. And then the right. industry shrank and all the a lot of young people got squeezed out. And Don mm -hmm. was basically out of the picture for a while. But he returned in the 70s and uh, he was sort of the leading light. He'd been a director on Rescuers, which was a picture that had uh, sort of forward-looking feel to it at the time. And he directed yeah. Pete's Dragon and... Uh, small one um mm -hmm. so i, I think he left very, right around that time was right? that i think he left right around that time well, that's right? the he thing. Didn't i got there in the, right at the, the nexus of the crossfire between this yeah. feud between this, the uh you know the up-and-coming folks like you know john musker and and uh uh brad bird and all those guys mm -hmm. and don Ronald blue Clements. and I, yeah. I i i sort of cast my lot with bluth and his crew and then they all left <laughs> and mm. so i was kind of hanging out in the wind and uh yeah what was the reason were you did you just was he just kind of a charismatic very, guy who very you felt much, very much and uh -huh. I, I you know again it's the power of the press i what i'd read had made such an impression on me i thought well this is the guy yeah. and you know he really was doing i mean based on you know fox and the hound which you know was kind of a stopgap kind of movie and kind of a mediocre story um, mm -hmm. Don was, you know, talking about making this movie Secret of Nim, and he was making this short film in his garage, and he was really being much more ambitious with the production values, particularly. And so yeah. I wanted to be part of that. So uh, what happened is that they left, and then I was sort of left hanging out in the breeze, and uh, uh, I got let go a few months later from Disney, and then I sort of begged my way onto the crew of the the end of. Uh, the Bluth short, which was called Banjo, the Woodpile Cat. And then based yep. on the strength, it was sort of like the Eric Larson thing, based, based on the strength of working with the crew through the end of that project, 
Don mm-hmm. didn't think I would be a particularly good animator, but he thought I'd be good in story. So uh, he mm. put me on story, and I, and I did. I you know I didn't storyboard on the movie. He storyboarded Secret Nim entirely himself. But I was in story wow. meetings with him, and um, I did write. I wrote dialogue uh, mm-hmm. for some of the scenes. Uh, some of the things I like. Uh, John Pomeroy came up with the idea of casting Dom DeLuise as the crow. And Don mm. Bluth didn't feel comfortable writing for Dom because he didn't quite get his uh, humor at first. Right. And right. so I wrote like a bunch of dialogue for him that eventually became for character. Dom DeLuise. Yeah. 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 Oh, that's awesome. Oh, my God. Like, uh, yeah. like what like what scenes in particular? I mean, uh, you know, I could probably the, recite them with you. The first scene where she sees him struggling with the string and all that. And then. Yeah. You know, uh, uh, you know, I was I was writing stuff all over the movie. I was also doing like little bits and pieces of animation uh, too, but nothing, okay. nothing seriously uh, exciting. So, yeah. but that was the first recording I went to, um, and I was asked to go to all the the, the talent recordings for the voice recordings for mm-hmm. uh, Secret of Man. So I got uh, the only one I didn't see was John Carradine, who did the owl's voice. He died very oh, shortly wow. afterwards. But Dom DeLuise was the first person i ever actually sat in a session with and pitched ideas to and heard him reading my lines and it was it was it was like a, it was it was like uh, you know a, i had to pinch myself dumb Dom was what a so thrill. funny and yeah. uh he's hilarious he was at the top of his game back then too it's 1970 yeah. whatever that was 1980 yeah he was doing a cannonball run oh, absolutely. and all those movies yeah, he, he, you know he was wearing the cap from Cal- cannonball run the first time he came in wow and he was he was abs and he <laughs> He was hilarious, and uh, uh, I guess I'll just say he was so foul mouthed. It was absolutely funny because <laughs> he would every time he he loved a take, he would yeah. curse in the most florid uh, uh, obscenities you could imagine. It was it was just it was absolutely hilarious because I'm thinking of this crow in my head. And, here he is, you know, <laughs> swearing and saying all this, ah, your mother's ass and all this. <laughs> but he was funny and he, and he loved to talk about comedy, um, which right. was just like, oh, my. I, I mean, if I hadn't been I wanted to be an animator from the time I could remember my earliest memory. But if I hadn't been, I would have loved to have been a comedian. And Dom, uh, you know, just listening to somebody like that, sitting there at 20 and listening to this guy talk about comedy and all of his influences and all the people wow. who knew it. It just it was it was just like uh, heaven, you know. That's so cool. What was the studio like? You know, uh, I mean, it, 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 was it was it, it? I would imagine that it was not fancy by any means, right? I mean, we it, were and wasn't it in a, uh-huh. like a very cramped but very nice building that isn't there anymore in Studio City, and it managed they managed to hold everybody in there. Eventually, they they bought they annexed some space at a building down the street but it was right across from Arts Deli and uh, Studio City which is very nice you know right where CBS uh, the valley end of CBS is located and uh, mm-hmm. it was nice it was a nice little white brick building with was new with blue tiles and it what you couldn't see it from the street it was uh, behind another there were two buildings they were identical and the building that was on the street level or at, that you could see from the street was uh, a Persian restaurant, and then there mm-hmm. was a courtyard and a fountain, and then there was uh, the studio, and um, it was it, it was packed to the gills. I mean, I, I don't even know yeah. uh, if we'd get away with what the fire marshal knew what we were doing, but um, yeah. it was. And of course, you know, the movie the movie was uh, sort of it was essentially Bluth's first major foray. Yeah. To, to a feature film that was going to compete with Disney. Yeah. And I, and I know that, you know, on, on the external side of things, you know, publicly, it, it, the hope was is that they were going to uh, create a, a spark for even Disney and other studios, too. Yes. Uh, was, there a, was there a sense of um, excitement uh, by the crew oh, that yeah. they were doing something you- as – yeah, go ahead. Euphoria. There was like a sense yeah. of euphoria because, um, I mean, the people that got into animation back then were so crazy. And so there were so few of us that, yeah. uh, you know, you had to be part of this crazy mindset to be to even get mixed up in it. So, uh, you know, all my life as a kid, I really admired Disney. And really from the time I was about nine or ten on, I was I was fixated on Disney exclusively. But even coming up through the teen years, um, I felt like, 
you know, the Disney stuff was kind of hit and miss through the 70s. Mm -hmm. And I was really hoping that they get some competition because that would make even Disney a better studio. So um, Bakshi was sort of the great, great hope for a while, even though I was mm -hmm. too young to see his movies. My, my brother had seen them and he told me about them. And I thought, okay, well, and I'd seen some clips of Bakshi movies on uh, talk shows. So I thought, well, maybe this yeah. guy is the guy to go with. You know, right. And then I'd read about this Bluth yeah. guy in the New York Times. I thought, oh, okay, well, here comes some comments. This sounds hopeful because prior to that, there yeah. really was nothing. There was just the TV yeah. industry, which was almost like a whole, an entirely different animal um, with mm -hmm. very, very limited chance, animation. You know? Did you get a chance to see uh, the movie before it was released? Almost never. Uh, it was, it yeah. was, it was a very, and I think this actually <laughs> may reflect in the film. Um, it was it was made one sequence at a time. We never really, you know, we had outlines that, that were constantly being updated, but we never really knew mm -hmm. where it was going. Part of the problem yeah. was that the book it's based on, uh, which, frankly, even at the time, this I thought is, was not a particularly good book. I hope I'm not offending uh -huh. anybody. Uh, but, it's my favorite uh, book. I, I, I remember reading it much later. It's a, it's a very inconclusive book. At the end, you really don't under you really can't figure out what happens, and I realized when I read it later after making the movie, the the writer was setting up a series. <coughs> oh, really? <laughs> it was written by a man whose whose uh, pen name was Robert C. O'Brien, and he was setting okay. up a, a, like a Tolkien esque series. Everybody's doing series because of the Lord of the Rings in the seventies was such a right. big hit, and right. I think he intended for this Secret of Nim to be a whole series about Mrs. Frisbee and Jonathan, and Jonathan's children, okay. and them take. But the whole thing was well, he died before the book was actually published. His real name oh, wasn't no. O'Brien. I can't remember what his real name was, but he was an, an editor for National Geographic, and he passed away. And the book was published posthumously, and because of its some of the themes and content in it, it, it got. Uh, all the big book awards that year. So it was, it had been optioned by Disney at one point, which I'm sure that's why Don was interested in it. Um, yeah. So, but, but we never really knew where it was going. And uh, Don would. I am seeing, by the way, I am seeing Robert C. O'Brien. Yeah, that's his name, that's but that, name. that's not his real name. It was a pen name. Gotcha. Gotcha. Um, oh, Robert Leslie Carroll Conley. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I'm sure he's a fine gentleman, a fine editor. Um, I don't mean to disparage him. I just didn't think the book sure. was particularly consistent or clear. Mm -hmm. uh, if if you read the book, my memory of it is still pretty clear. It's kind of bifurcated. There's actually the two stories. There's a story about Mrs. Frisbee, as she's called in the, yep. in the book, and her sick children. And then she intersects with this, the rats of Nim, who are these super intelligent mice who've been tested on and um the the stories don't intersect very well and it all hmm. I, and I remember asking don early on you know i'm going to be part of the story you know development on this which story are we telling and initially <laughs> he put his fist down and he said we're telling the rat story and then like yeah. a few months later no we're telling the mouse's story and it's kind of oh, like no. that all the way through to the end and i um you know, I, 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 I don't really want to get into too much commentary about uh, my time there at the studio, but I, I, I was really I, I was really thrilled when I saw the picture finished finally because we only saw like a work reel once, like half the movie sure. about a year yeah. in. And then finally we saw the finished movie because um, it was a, and what did you think? Such an undertaking to edit it together. Yeah. Uh, that, what did you think of it? Well, at the rap party, I was elated. I thought we were, yeah. you know, going to be greeted as, as, as gods and heroes on the street. Um, <laughs> and then I went and saw it. Ten days later, it came out, and it was not in very many theaters. Um, and uh, I yeah. went and saw it with an audience. And about 90 seconds in, I realized it makes very little sense. <laughs> and uh, yeah. it's very uh, cryptic and ponderous yeah. and that uh, uh -huh. none of the things we talked about thematically were coming through. And we oh, uh, sat no. there with a very restless audience and realized this movie is uh, not what we hoped. 
Yeah. And well, I mean, I can tell you as as you know, like I said before, that is the movie that got me started in into wanting to be in the animation industry. Oh, it's great. I I love the I love the movie and it works for me. So I don't know if that helps uh, at all, but uh, I mean, obviously, <laughs> I I, I, I can tell you whatever you love <laughs> it is you love about the movie and whatever you think the story is based on what I understood we were talking about in the two and a half years of story meetings. Yeah. Almost none of yeah. it's in there. Yeah. Um, no, I totally it, understand it, there, that. There was this whole metaphysical thing and uh, whole metaphorical thing that we were talking about. And it, it just, it does, it does, it's, 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 it's not, it's, it, it just, no, you wouldn't get, you wouldn't know it if you weren't in the room listening to Don talk about it. So, um, yeah. Uh, you know, it was it was it was kind of crushing, and uh, the movie didn't have the push that a big D Disney movie has. So everybody was very very yeah. proud of it, but uh, we we um, we the, the studio went into kind of like a tailspin for a while, and yeah. then the Dragon Slayer game came in, and that sort of pulled everybody out of the fire. Exactly. Now, fast forwarding a little bit. Now, you you left there after a, a few years, right? And then you went to I think you went to I know you did a couple of things like you worked at Filmation. Yep. You did the the he the He Man. Were you animating for him for the He Man show? No, or no, no. It's, it's funny. I so I was at Bluth from seventy nine to the end. Of, it's end of seventy nine to the, like fall of eighty four, and okay. there was after Time Warp and. Uh, we were developing a bunch of stuff. There was another big layoff and there was just, you know, and I had to, you know, get a job. And so right. I, me and Chris Wall and Bruce Smith, we went to filmation and we had all been animating. Yeah. What's that? So Bruce Smith went with you. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Bruce, oh, wow. Bruce and Chris came in on the, uh, on the video games and they were good friends and still are good close friends. Of mine. And, uh, but, but the thing is what we were talking about, they're hiring over filmation. I said, yeah, but, you know, we'd only done full animation. So it was right. like we, we all convinced ourselves that there was this mystical process to doing limited animation for TV that we would never understand. So we all volunteered to take the assistance test. So they hired us as assistants. And then that was it. We were assistants. And then we, wow. when we went to work and started getting our assistant work, it was like, Oh my God! A monkey could animate this stuff because <laughs> he man. He so, now I'm going to be way too so candid limited because people. I know people love he man. It was the most degrading experience to have gone from Bluth, which was this, you know, yeah. the, this bastion of quality, to go to yeah. uh, you know whatever you want to say about filmation. Um, it was you know they turned out you know cut rate cartoons you know, yeah. on a budget. And, uh, you know, I, I liked a lot of the people there. I was certainly grateful to have worked there a couple of times, but um, I was so embarrassed to, right. <laughs> to be working yeah. on this. Email. Well, you, you know, it's, you know, it's funny. Um, I, I can't remember if I was into animation at the time when I was, when He-Man was very popular, but I do remember that maybe when I was looking at reruns, there was, you, you notice there were two different styles of animation in, in, in the He-Man shows. One was the very limited one. Right. And then there was always like the, a couple of scenes where He-Man would run towards yes. the towards the screen and it was like really fluid animation. It was almost like it was rotoscoped it was. or I'm not it sure. Was. What, it, was rotoscoped. Yeah. it was actually rotoscoped back in the 60s for Superman. And then right. they you kept using the same rotos for oh, no Tarzan way. and He-Man. Yeah, they just had like, you know, they would reuse anything. At filmation, yeah. and they basically had a stock library of reuse actions, and then anything that had to be new had to be limited by nature. And sure. um, the thing was, and I don't mean to denigrate anybody, but I'm gonna. Um, <laughs> the, the thing was, the animators, you, you didn't have to even understand animation, because the yeah. people that were the layout department, the character layout department, did everything. They took the storyboards and then they drew you know, meticulously on model, the poses, and then right. they indicated in, in colored pencil, separate this arm, and then then they would give you another drawing for this is the B pose for this arm, and then this oh, is, the, you know, and it was all done, the animation was all done by the layout artist. So they literally wow. had people animating 
who literally couldn't animate, but all they had to do was trace the, it was such a weird thing that wow. they, they would just trace the layout artist stuff, break it up under the right levels, then chart it and then send it to us to get, uh, to get in between the, the assistants. And I, what, what I worked on was the very last season or the crossover season between He-Man and She-Ra. Okay. Yeah. It's funny with filmation, re regardless of what the process was like, uh, for production, uh, crew like you guys, they were still incredibly, uh, popular as a, oh. as a TV animation studio. Oh. I mean, they were <laughs> doing all kinds I, of stuff. I know. Well, I, I tell you another landlady story, cause this is sort of how I gauge everything is ask my landlady. This is, uh, so it's, <laughs> it's, you know, I, I'm living in Burbank, still in an apartment. I'm in I think my second or third apartment. And, uh, yeah. you know, I, I had, uh, my landlady asked me, are you still doing cartoons? And I said, yeah. Did you see The Secret of Nim? And just, no. Did you see Dragon Slayer? No. So, well, I'm working on He-Man now. It's kind of, it's, oh, He-Man, I know that. Yeah, my nephew watched that. Like, oh, that's a good show. I'm like, oh. Oh, man. Uh, it was, yep, it was, exactly. It was, it was uh, so difficult. And then, and then Filmation uh, decided to get into the feature business. And they had uh -huh. this... Uh, this plan to make all these features to all these um, ostensibly public domain stories, but Disney had already done all of them. So there was, it was sort of like making unofficial Disney sequels. And uh, oh, really? so they made a Pinocchio feature and they made a Snow White feature. And then at that point, they were bought out by the uh, cosmetic company L'Oreal and sort of the beginning of the like Yahoo Wild West corporate wow. buyout era. And uh, wow. that was the end of that. So you, you were able to uh, pull out of the doldrums there and work your way back to Disney. How did that happen? Uh, it was not direct and it was not easy because mm. uh, I had been such a poor, made such a poor hash of my uh, myself at the studio the first time around that the guy in charge or well, the manager of the department was a guy named Ed Hansen and he was not fond of me. And he basically told me that I wasn't welcome. Uh, oh, no. But I came back a couple of times and looked at getting in, and at one point, in between working on the He-Man TV show and the uh, the Filmation features, Disney was going through a management upheaval, and Katzenberg and Eisner weren't there yet. Eisner hadn't been put in charge, but Miller okay. was being sort of edged out, and they put yep. this, they put a guy in charge of the studio named Richard Berger, and his mm -hmm. assignment was to figure out how to see if they could outsource animation. And the first, the, God, I, I, this is such a rambling tale, I'm just sound like Grandpa Simpson. But, but one of the first <laughs> things they did was they, had, they hired a, a local um, studio that did commercials called Rick Reiner Productions, very talented artist named Rick Reiner. And they had mm -hmm. him do a Winnie the Pooh short, a 20 minute Winnie the Pooh short called Day for Eeyore, which was based on more okay, of the yeah. stories. And then uh, shortly after that, they opened a division that was that did a that, that was going to do Disney character shorts, Goofy, Mickey, and Donald, and they they yeah. got uh, Daryl Van Sitters, who was uh, uh, yeah. one of the young animators who was really casting about for a project. And they said, "Well, why don't you take over this special projects unit?" And he did a short called "Fun with Mr. Future," uh, and mm. uh, he was uh, you know he started at one point he looked like he was going to be the guy who's going to do Roger Rabbit, you know. So Daryl, mm. um, they put him in a building in North Burbank and set him up on a Goofy show that was called Goofy Soccer Mania. And Joe Ram yeah. storyboard. I remember it. that one. And uh, there was some good animation in there. What's that? There was some good animation in there. I remember as a kid enjoying it. Well, I don't know which version you saw. There's there's more than one one take on Soccer Mania. Uh, because, well, it, it came out in the 80s. That's what I remember. Uh, okay. We'll get there. Uh, yeah. So what Daryl did was he <laughs> made a 22-minute 20, 20 short, 22 minute short called Soccer Man. It was supposed to be a TV special. Um, and we got it through. We got it all in color. And, and I got on as one of the animators. Um, and Daryl uh, gave me some of the first really good cartoony scenes I ever got to do. And I was doing Goofy, who I love, and uh, the Beagle Boys and all these great characters. So I... My portfolio finally had some decent, you know, Disney stuff in it, but I wasn't, I was freelancing. I wasn't working on the lot. So mm -hmm. um, that shut down and they were tooling up to do another short. Uh, but then uh, Eisner came in and they said, no, we, we don't want to do this. We don't want an off the, off the lot department. They shut down Daryl's 
department. And then they took the Soccer Mania show, which they, they cut up and had, uh, hmm. uh, I think, Matt O'Callaghan and Steve Hickner took it over and re-edited it into an hour special with very little left of what we had done. Because I, okay. I, I know I sat through it, and I don't think there were any of my scenes left in it. About, what, 87, and you're getting no, this close is, to... This is, uh, <laughs> this is still 85. I was really ping-ponging oh, okay. around a lot at that point. So 85, 86, uh, I can't get hired at Disney. They're going through this big management upheaval. I get onto the, the, the feature crew for the Filmation features, and okay. at least they were bankrolling full animation in the first one anyway. So at least I'm doing full animation again, so that's okay. And Bruce got hired onto that one with me, so we were, like, you know, uh, getting onto that. And it was kind of – we kind of lucked out because Filmation had an old guard um, uh, staff. There were a bunch of guys who were sort of like the uh, the mainstays. But they needed them for the TV shows, so they needed people that could actually – handle full animation for the um the feature so bruce and i got picked to, to do a lot of that and uh i was there for about 18 months and then i i just got itchy and i started i ran into glenn Keane, who i had been i had met at uh during fox and the hound and i had been not uh, a particularly useful member of his crew for a few weeks <laughs> when i was first starting out i was kind of rebellious and difficult and I, and I think he finally just went to Ed and said you know I don't want this guy in my unit so uh but you know I I, I approached him and I said I, I I know you're working on the uh chipmunk movie uh he because he was on hiatus he, he loaned himself out from Disney to work on uh, a feature movie based on Alone of the Chipmunks a 2D feature yeah and he took me on and gave me some scenes to animate and based on that we stayed in touch and he showed my portfolio at some point, and then I mm -hmm. didn't hear anything for months. And then, uh, like many months later, when I was kind of down to my last nickel, um, Ed Hansen called me up and told me I was welcome back, and that was 87. Okay. The, at the dawn so of that... all, uh, Oliver and Company was just getting going. Oh, okay. Okay. Yeah. And around that time where they, I'm, I'm assuming that they were probably cranking up, I think, what was it? Uh, Oliver and company came out in 88 and then was little mermaid 90. Is that what it 89. was? 89. Yeah. So they were oh, like back to back yeah. at that point. They were, the, that, yeah. Oliver was the beginning of releasing one per year, which okay, was just right. a mind blowing thing because prior to that Disney features came out every two or three or four years. There was no schedule. Sure. But the new yeah. management so wanted been... one every year, and that was scary. Yeah, but, but at the same time, I'm assuming that was kind of exciting at the same time? Or what was the studio like at that point? Were people pretty pumped about yeah. you know, the fact that they were you know, pretty jazzed up about doing animation again and yeah. really taking it seriously? Yeah. I, I, I think yeah. you know, for a long time it was kind of hit and miss because I, I really do, and I, I won't get into all the politics of it, but, but I really do think that uh, – Initially, um, Eisner really didn't want to do the features. He wasn't that interested in it. And he was actually, as far as I'm concerned, my, my, my take on it was that he was looking for a way to shut the division down. But they couldn't do it oh, wow. quickly and they couldn't do it easily. And then when Howard Ashman came in and wanted to do, you know, bring sort of uh, Broadway musical mentality to it, that was very exciting to everybody. I mean, I, I, to me too. Yeah. I mean, I had just seen... Um, Right before I got hired back in 87, I had just seen The Little Shop of Horrors on uh, a movie on screen, and I was so yeah. blown away by it. And I just thought, oh, my God, I'm, so, you know, I was unemployed, and I was between jobs, and I couldn't really tell where my career was going to go. And, you know, a year later, I'm working on Little Mermaid. Howard mm. and Al Mekin are writing it, and it's just, it was, it was mind-blowing. Um, Amazing. And so you you worked on the Little Mermaid, and um, you actually worked on one of my favorite characters. To be honest, uh, Grimsby was <laughs> just beautifully animated. If I if if you don't mind me saying, oh, um, such you. a great character, and and one that doesn't get talked about very much. But I still I, uh, I still remember the the his expressions were the best. I mean, you know, uh, he was he was really the comic relief even though he was this stiff yeah um, i love that kind you know, of character and it didn't yeah. bother me that the character was really going to be overlooked in every respect for all eternity right. because uh i just liked the character so much 
and I'll tell you anything you want to say about the expressions. You have to. Uh, I, I have to defer to Dan Haskett, who was uh, came and left during the the pre-production uh, of development of, of Little Mermaid. At one point, he was designing all the characters, and he had done this drawing of this lanky John Gilgood esque character. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. I loved it. I said, is this a one-off character or is this character a regular character in the show? He said, oh, he's a regular character. And Dan, to, uh, who's really just godlike talent and somebody I really idolize, he said, you should mm. ask the directors if you could animate it. And I was like, I don't, I'm not up to that level yet. <laughs> and, <laughs> and I did. And, and then they let me. And uh, wow. it was a struggle. I got to say, it was a very difficult character to animate. It was you know, the very doing the deadpan stuff is very restrained, and yep. or, but the thing was everybody was struggling because uh -huh. the the funny thing about Little Mermaid was we'd all been uh, complaining and, and 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 spoiling for a movie that was oh we want to make a movie like one of the old classics we want to make a movie well now we were doing it and nobody was ready for it because <laughs> wow. it was like everybody was just like this material is so good. And yep. everybody was just, you know, burning crazy overtime hours to uh, to to get to, to to live up to the material. Yeah, I think that's one one thing that many people don't really understand is the grueling uh, work that's needed to produce the kind of quality that's that was well. I mean, even nowadays, mm -hmm. um, but but back then it was just. You know, when you look at the credits and you see all those mm -hmm. hundreds of mm -hmm. people, it's because they're trying to meet the demands of, you know, a a release date, and it requires a tremendous amount, a lot of people, a lot of a lot of work, hours. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, it's it's incredibly stressful. I mean, I've heard horror stories <laughs> about people who've gotten divorces and families yeah. that have broken up, yeah. and yeah, uh, it's pretty pretty. So I suppose that this is around the time when things like that started to crank up, huh? <laughs> a little after, yeah, but yeah, that started happening in the late '80s, early '90s, mid '90s. You know, happened to me, um, yeah. and it's a tough. It's it's a very demanding thing, and you know, when you think about it, it's like, well, you know, you're making a movie. You know, people always say, "Oh my God, they take so long to make." So yeah, but yeah. you think of it, you're making a movie one frame at a time. Um, yeah, it's a, exactly. you know, it's a crazy, you know, I always said if flip books didn't exist before live action film, nobody would yep. draw animation because it, you know, if there had been movie cameras before flip books and somebody said, Hey, why don't we draw this? <laughs> they, you know, right. It would have been sent to the right. crazy house, but, uh, yeah. yeah, it's, 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 a, it's a demanding thing. And I think, uh, you know, to this day, I still, you know, put in crazy hours and, uh, 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 you know, just because it, it there's there's never enough time to do yeah. justice to what you're trying to do, and and most of the work you're doing now is uh, is storyboarding, right? Yeah, is that correct? Yeah, and, uh -huh. and which is great because in the digital age, you know, I work on a Cintiq. Uh, you know, they they expect much more out of a storyboard than they did 20, 30 years ago. So you know, where you used to draw like ten panels to describe a scene, you now are drawing hundreds. But it, it really oh, wow. is like animating. I love it. So it's sort of like making a pose test of an entire episode. And oh, uh, really? So you actually are. It, it, it's so it is that in depth where you're practically animating. Because I, I always wondered because I see a lot of the uh, CG movies where you have um, uh, pencil. They look essentially look like pencil tests. Yeah. Uh, and 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 me being the person who prefers traditional animation i mean i love cg but mm -hmm. um i prefer traditional animation that's where my heart is i always say where is this movie when i see the pencil te pencil test of the <laughs> cg characters <laughs> i know um, but the, i know is it's that such different? a weird thing it's you know because to love a love drawing i you know i just always loved drawing so i i didn't understand that to other people the whole thing of a line drawing is really second rate to yeah. com compared to a photograph or a CG image, and um, yeah. um, you know, once once they've seen it in CG, they're they're not going to go back, um, yeah. uh, which is sad. But I still I still get such a kick out of a good drawing. I just mm. yeah, I want to delve into you know where you are now. The, the history part is incredibly important to me, and I and I know that people love hearing about these stories. It's, so don't because it's funny. Don't worry I you know that. I I enjoy it to an extent too, and I I certainly you know read all the animation history I could back when there was none, 
<laughs> yeah. But, yeah. But I, at this stage, I don't understand it because it's like when I look at stuff, including older stuff that I'm not that well versed in, um, I'm like, uh, who cares? Let it speak right. for itself. Um, yeah. Really good work speaks for itself. And these people that get, I see these online pitch battles where people claim to know what they're talking about and they don't. Oh, and so and so did yeah. this, and oh, and so and so was famous for this, and so and so had this bet. Who cares? The work yeah. should speak for itself, and it does. I mean, that's the that's why it's great. Why I I rest watch a cartoon with a room full of kids than a room full of animation scholars. <laughs> 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 that's awesome well i mean that's kind of the crux of what we're living in now with social media and everybody's yeah, uh, that's true. armchair armchair director yeah. um and critic so uh, it's it's unfortunately it's not going to change anytime soon and hopefully we can just figure out different ways to to manage through that uh, when you think about movies that are coming out for example, that was, so, you know, like hand-drawn animation is not gone. It's still very vital and still utilized a tremendous amount, obviously, in television, yeah. but uh, also, you know, European countries, J Japan, China. Mm -hmm. uh, I think I just saw recently that the new Lion King received less at the box office than a hand-drawn animated film from China hmm. that came out at the same time. Hmm. Um, so hand-drawn animation is still really huge. And then now we've got Netflix who's pouring tons of money into yeah. uh, into animation right now, including the the movie that Sergio yeah. Pablos is yeah. working on, right? Claws. Uh, with yeah. Claws. You know, are, are you hopeful that, and, and is it even much of an interest to you that, you know, maybe hand-drawn animation could potentially come back into the foray a little bit more? Yeah, because uh, I, I would love to animate again. That was really the thing I enjoyed doing the most. And I would love yeah. if I was, you know, cast right. And, uh, you know, I spent a long time, so I'm a little rusty, but I would I would love to animate again. And I think I, at this point, I'd be better than I ever was because I know so much more and I, I draw better than, well, mm -hmm. I don't know if I draw that much, but I draw better than I did yesterday. I know that. that that's yeah. kind of how I gauge everything, but I, um, I, I don't, I, I, yeah, I, I just hope it happens. You know, I, I'm always open to it. Um, mm -hmm. and I, you know, at, you at, at this point, the thing is Mike, that I, um, you know, I used to really crave being on the, the cool project, the thing that was going to get yeah. all the attention and spotlight. And I've done that enough time in my career that I don't need to anymore. So I've worked on a lot of things that have either been little tiny things off in the, you know, out of the spotlight or, you know, I work, uh, I've been working on a Tom and Jerry series that doesn't even run in the U S uh, but mm. it's a boomerang series and it's been a lot of fun to do. I don't really, you know, what the profile of the project is, doesn't excite me as much as what is the actual content and who am I going to be working with? So if yeah. the opportunity came up to animate again and that were possible, uh, uh, yeah, I would do it. Sure. I, I would yeah, tell me, it. tell me, tell me more about, um, what you, uh, what your main role is now and what kind you know, what kinds <clears throat> of, um, excitement do you get out of that? I mean, obviously you said you're a storyboard artist for the most part now, and, well, and it's a completely different paradigm than it was back then. Yeah, so it's very walk, different. walk me through that. It's a different business. I mean, it's, it's really, you know, it's amazing how much things have changed. You know, when I started, as I, I think I mentioned earlier, that it was a very small, dedicated group of crazy people that thought they that wanted to be animators that came into the business in the, the late 70s and early 80s. And um, mm -hmm. there was a there was sort of a trade off in that the uh, there wasn't very much work around. Um, yeah. So the jobs were few and far between and scarce and hard to get and hard to hang on to. But the trade off was that the talent pool was tiny. Um, hundreds of okay. people, you know, right now it's thousands of people. Yeah. And the trade off yeah. is there's more work, but the trade off yep. on that is most of the work now is short term. Um, mm. So, you know, it's very hard to find a home anymore where you're going to, you know, sit down and be there with the same crew for eight, nine years. Like I was, you know, in the, in the Renaissance days there, as they're called. Mm. So yeah, that's, that's kind of, that's kind of what makes the business different uh, in that respect. Mm -hmm. What I do now is I'm actually writing this Tom and Jerry series and I really? started out storyboarding it. And then the two guys who'd been writing the show, 
um, didn't want to write it anymore. And we didn't mm -hmm. think it was going to get renewed because usually they only renew Tom and Jerry, you know, for a couple of years at a time, every time they reboot mm -hmm. it. But um, they, they wanted to reboot it and they asked, Wonders asked me to take over as the head writer. And because I, I was rewriting a lot of my stuff on the boards, frankly. So the mm -hmm. executive producer, his name is Jay Bastian, very talented and funny guy. He recognized that. And then the show is directed by Daryl Van Sitters, who I mentioned at the Sport Movie yeah. Project back in oh, 85. Awesome. So, you know, this is an interesting thing to, to just sort of plant in the minds of all the, the folks uh, thinking about starting a career. This Sport Goofy project that I worked on in 1985 that got cut up and repurposed and turned into the show that you saw, basically the version I worked on never saw the light of day. But that job, that job was so critical for me because it put scenes in my portfolio that got me hired back at Disney two years later. Mm -hmm. And it forged a steady and reliable relationship, working relationship between me and the director, Daryl Van Sitters. And to this mm -hmm. day, we're working. I've freelanced for Daryl ever since. He started his own company in 87, yeah. 88, because he left the studio when Eisner came in. And then he started his own company, Renegade Animation, was a partner, mm -hmm. uh, producing partner named uh, uh, Ashley Postal Wayne, and we've worked together ever since on commercials and TV specials and all sorts. So they asked me to storyboard on the show in 2012, and it was Tom and Jerry, which I love drawing. Mm -hmm. And then, uh, then, then I took over writing in season three, and I've written, you know, season, yeah, three, four. I've written, been the head writer for season three, four, and five. Wow, and that's being you said that's being um, shown exclusively through Boomerang. Is that right? It's it's shown all over the world. It's shown in the UK. It's shown in Asia. Um, it's big okay. in Egypt, um, but but uh, they don't show it in the US. I, I guess they should. Really, they, the show is a uh, half hour with three seven minute cartoons, but I guess um, they show individual episodes we've done. Like you can see them on the app, although they only mm -hmm. go up to season two. On the okay. So uh, this uh, none of the shows I've written have uh, turned up. So I, I don't know. Oh, um, bummer. But you know, I just got the app. By the way, <coughs> what's that? I just got the app actually oh. just uh, about a couple weeks ago because I wanted to see the classics yeah. uh, in in high def. So you know, I, I bit the bullet. Um, so I'll definitely have to check that out. Unfortunately, your none of your stuff is on there. That's a bummer. But you know what's? I have a question though. So did you? I thought you mentioned that Warner Brothers now owns it. Is that right? They own yeah. the rights yeah. to well, Tom they, and Jerry. Yeah, Ted Turner bought the MGM library in this '80s, mid '80s, okay. early. 80s. Okay. And that Ted Turner owns Warner Brothers too. It all became one big company. Oh, so so Warner see. owns Looney Tunes and all the MGM cartoons, Tom and Jerry, Tex Avery, all that stuff, which is kind of nice to have them all under one roof. I guess. Yeah. 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 So you've been, so that's largely what you've been focusing on, um, uh, full time. Is that right? Yeah, That's the last, it's been the last three or four years. Yeah. Wow. That's so cool. I'm, I'm, I'm always fascinated with, uh, with how, uh, uh, how many different um, lives that Tom and Jerry has? I has, know. I mean, it's it's <laughs> no. been around for so long. Like what the nineteenth early early nineteen thirties, late nineteen thirties. They, they something started like that? in nineteen forty, I think. So next year is the eightieth anniversary of Tom and Jerry. But yeah, the, the funny thing is, whenever I mention to like you know my dentist or you know my eye doctor, oh, I'm working on Tom and Jerry. Oh, they're making more Tom and Jerrys. What they don't realize, they've never not made Tom and Jerry. They you know they officially yeah. stopped stop making the original MGM uh, Bill and Joe uh, 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 films in 1957. But then they turned yeah. around and, and started, you know, outsourcing them to first Gene Deitch when he was doing those and yep. wherever he was. I actually really, I, I actually really dig that style. Um, his work I thought was pretty cool. <laughs> okay. Well, I'm a big fan yeah, of Gene I, mean, I know he wasn't really crazy about doing Tom and Jerry, so I won't say yeah. much more about that. But uh, then Chuck Jones did them for about 10 years. Yep, and I love his work there too. And then they came back to Hanna-Barbera in the 70s when I was in high school for Saturday morning. Yeah. And then they became Tom and Jerry Kids and Tom and Jerry Tales. And they, you know, they don't, they haven't been uninterrupted, but you know, mm -hmm. almost uninterrupted ever since 1957. There's been uh, either uh, Filmation did it for a while, 
They 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 had they, they? they had a very low budget Tom and Jerry series in the eighties. So it's always okay. somewhere in the wings somebody's warming up a Tom and Jerry series, which is fine because the characters go on and on forever. But the ones people always remember the best are the the original shows because they're just so good. Yeah. So one one of the things that I I think would be a great way to sort of round out our conversation this evening is. Um, you wrote a blog that I ran into via Cartoon Brew, um, and it was really talking about what it's like to have a career in animation. And it was your own thoughts on the difference between getting a job and having a career yeah. in animation. Can you speak a little bit sure. towards that? Because it's obviously so important uh, these days, as we've talked about how different things have become in the animation industry. Uh, yeah. can you talk a little bit about that? Sure. Um, I, that, you know, I, I had a blog for a long, a long time. It's, it's, it might be still around. I haven't done anything on it in years, but yeah, that I used a very clickbaity title and as a result got the highest number of hits I ever got. It was, a, it was called how not to get a, how, why you don't want a job in animation. And it's really yeah, it's it a worked. semantic sleight of hand. It's you don't want a job yeah. because you want a career, really. Do you want to tell people where that blog, what the name of the blog? Um, I think it's uh, just wilson.blogspot. Last time I searched it, I couldn't find it, but I think it's still there. Yeah. Um, and if you go back two or three installments, it might might be there. So uh, the, the idea behind it was that, you know, my dream you know, kind of from the point I was 10 years old and learning about the nine old men was I wanted that cradle to grave job at Disney to, to just work there from my first day in the business to, to the end. And then, yeah. you know, through the good graces of Eric Larson, I got my first job at Disney, but then through the grace of me being kind of immature and not really ready for it, I got let go in less than a year. So, you know, at the time it was devastating because there, the dream was over as quickly as it started. But, right. you know, I scrambled around. I got my job at, uh, you know, I got a job with Bluth and then I went to Filmation. Then I went to Daryl and then I went back to Filmation. And then I went to Disney again. And then I was at DreamWorks and then and Warner Brothers and freelancing. And the result was, um, you know, if I, and I know people that stayed at Disney all through those years, it's like, there were a lot of things. There's only one project that happened at Disney that I wish I'd worked on that I hadn't during those years. And that was Great Mouse Detective, which was John and Ron's first film, which I still mm. really like. But I really didn't yep. miss anything. I, I didn't want to work on Box and the Hound. I didn't want to work on Mickey's Christmas Carol. I wouldn't have want to work on a Black Cauldron. I'm so happy with the pictures I got to work on. And I couldn't be more satisfied with the assignments I got on them. Um, yeah. But in the meantime, in between those times, I was, you know, writing at Bluth and working with Dom DeLuise and then animating this sort of weird stuff for filmation and uh, <laughs> meeting all these people on freelance and doing, you know, I remember doing a spot for UNICEF where I figured out how to, you know, do a certain kind of limited animation I'd never done before. And uh, it, it was so much more varied and interesting that if I'd gotten what I wanted, which would have been to just stay at Disney, you know, the entire time. And then the upshot was that I was back at Disney in, you know, whenever it was, 2004, 2000, around there. And that was like, you know, my 25th year in the business. And a, a lot of guys my age who'd been there the whole time were getting their 25-year pins, but they're also getting their pink slips because, you know, right. the tide had turned and they were letting all, you know, a lot of, most of my generation go. And they didn't know what to make of it. They didn't, they weren't, yeah. you know, they, they just had never prepared for the day they weren't. At Disney, and and I didn't have to worry about that anymore, because yeah. I knew that you know I'd figure I'd figure something out. <laughs> so uh, yeah. you know, it it because it, it turns out you know I always, I always write about you know there's a few things I don't have mixed feelings about, but I always write to people about you know beware of the things you're in love with, because they can become traps, mm. um, and we become prisoners of love, and where people are addicted to their beliefs and their you know, they're, they're the, the things that they want to do and they never see any or experience anything else. And I was sort of forced Absolutely. to experience a lot of things that I, I wouldn't have otherwise. And I couldn't be happier for it. I couldn't be more grateful for it. I don't have a 25 yeah. year pin, you know, I don't have a Tinkerbell statuette or whatever they give, you know, at that point, but uh, I, I wouldn't trade it for anything. I've had such a colorful career. I've met so many great people. I've worked with so many terrific people. I don't think that I, I, 
I literally, I used to say that there, there isn't a job I have, there isn't a job I've worked on that I didn't learn something from. Uh, yeah. There actually is one now. <laughs> Apart from that, uh, for 40 years, I've learned something new on every job. And yeah. uh, I look forward to the next new thing I learn. Yeah, I've, I, I almost feel like in some ways that path of not having that steady, cozy job creates some metal in in oneself, right? Yes. I mean, you get to you get to understand that it's not that nothing lasts forever. Yes. Really. Yes. And 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 being okay with that yep. and enjoying that part of it, and that seems like that that, that seems like the road that you've. Uh, that you've created for yourself there. You've, you've become one uh, with that path, um, which I think is just incredibly important for anybody who's getting into the animation industry these days. Don't look at it as a negative, see it as a positive. Yeah, yes, yes. Actually, it is important to be flexible, be versatile. And, um, you know, there have been times when I've been let go. There have been times when I've left on my own power. You know, uh, there have been times when I've just felt I'd been at one thing too long and I got itchy and it was like, I want to try something new. And it turned out to be that that's kind that's that that's 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 um, kind of the way you got to be in the job market now, because nothing does last forever. And sooner or later, you know, uh, things change and the environment changes. And there's a lot I can say about that. Uh, mm. It's a whole other conversation. Um, yeah, because it's really important to understand the environment you're in and to find an environment where you can thrive. Um, and sometimes it's not where you think it's going to be. Um, yeah. You know, you know, I I, um, I spoke with uh, Claire Keen uh -huh. uh, a couple months back and, um, you know, she does. She was when she was working at Disney, she was doing a lot of story work as well. And uh, as she was working, actually, I take that back. She was working more as like a concept artist. Yeah. Um, and she said that uh, that was one of the best jobs you could have in the animation industry because, firstly, you're not working 3,000 hours a week. Um, and you really get to delve into the character uh, more. So there's this – you have a lot of say in what the story and the character – how it how it moves and and the emotional content you really have a lot of power in controlling that would you say that that's the case for you too now that you're not doing predominantly animation but worried you know but your focus is more on story well it's a little bit different and i think my my attitude is different to it because i think i have a different skill set skill set than she does um and yeah. i can certainly understand her point of view my thing was when, when i you know i originally wanted to be an animator but very quickly, I got stared into story almost as a fluke. So I was working, you know, writing for Bluth and stuff like that. And I didn't mm -hmm. like it as much because, you know, mm -hmm. there were a lot of animators. Oh, how do you get in story? You're in story. You're on your way. And it's like, no, yeah. first of all, story is brutal because you're constantly mm -hmm. being rejected. And second of all, when you see your scenes up there, that's you. That's that's yeah. your animation. That's you. Yeah, you right. did that. You Every frame of that is your idea your mentality your personality your your draftsmanship yeah. and when you write something and then you board it or someone else boards it and then someone re reads it a different way and then it gets posed out by somebody else and animated by somebody <laughs> else and it's like well that's kind of what i meant <laughs> it's not it's, <laughs> it's not nearly as satisfying and as a result right. I, yeah I, you know you can cut this out if you want but i, I actually no, don't see it. a lot of the things i write um yeah. once i'm done with the writing or if i board it or if i'm involved in boarding of it i'm done i i, I yeah. actually don't and first of all i trust the director and then for me it's done when everybody's happy with my writing you know, yeah. and sometimes I will see something I've written and it's, you know, they've changed the ending or, you know, it, it, it got directed differently than the way I saw in my head. And it's fine. But it's, it's, yeah. it's yeah. not like it is when, as an animator, I got to see my scenes up there. And that, that just was, oh, you're making me want nothing, nothing <laughs> like it. You're really making me want to get back to the, back to the desk. Oh, man. Because that was so well, great. Yeah. Oh, you know, I mean, honestly, you know, and we'll wrap this up here. I want to be respectful of your time, but I, I, I do mean this. Um, y your animation was just I, I used to look at your stuff and um, 
I would describe you to friends of mine as sort of like the modern day uh, Ward Kimball. You had that. So, and I, I, I'm not trying to be, I promise, I'm not trying to just, you know, <clears throat> throw you flowers or anything like that, but uh, your, your animation was always fantastic. And I hope that maybe this conversation will, sp <laughs> will spark you a little uh, and to, to, to maybe look at stepping into it again, because you were such a brilliant animator. Uh, and I would love to see your work, uh, as you've just described, I'd love to see your work um, on the screen again, and uh, hopefully, hopefully that can happen sooner than later. Well, you and you do me a great honor by comparing me to Ward Kimball because I, I not nowhere in that league, but uh, I, I thank you. And uh, you know, I got to meet him a few times. We didn't become friends or anything, but I got to meet him, and, and I could I could go on and on about him and his eccentricities, uh, but. Uh, he was uh, wonderful. I, you know, a genius. The, the animator I really identified with most, ultimately, and I, I didn't know any of them on a first name mm -hmm. basis. But Ollie Johnson to me was mm. was to, to me when I see Ollie's stuff, it's, it's it always goes right to my heart. And uh, yeah. I emul I consciously am you know I never like to in imitate anybody, but I consciously emulated him from time to time. And the thing is that. Um, to the extent I was able to get good was through, all through the good graces of the many, many people who mentored me, um, yeah. and, and, and beat it into me because it was, a it was a real struggle to learn. And, and, yeah. uh, but it was an absolute pleasure as it was a struggle because every little breakthrough was just like a miracle. And, yeah. uh, uh, they still are. And, uh, uh, you know, like I say, getting to animate, if you had showed me as a kid, that you're going to animate this clock character and you're going to animate this parrot and you know work on you know all these fantastic movies i would have i almost wouldn't have believed you because mm -hmm. you know i certainly was gearing up for that even as a little kid but it, it just it, i i sometimes look back on it and think that what you it, and, and believe me it was not easy it was a struggle getting in there the struggle <laughs> getting back it was a struggle getting those roles but it was so worth it and uh yeah. It was so, you know, that for all the things that went wrong, I was finally up to the challenges I got when I got them. That yep. was uh, really satisfying. Yeah. Awesome. Awesome. Will, I think we're going to have to yeah. close it out with that. Uh, it was such a pleasure talking with you, and hopefully um, we could find some time to do a part two at some point. I uh, still have so many questions to ask you. Um, okay. We barely t scratched the surface of of, uh, of your career. But um, thank you so much thank uh, you, for, for being a part of this. And is there any – Is there? can you tell people where they can find you online? Oh, you know, I'm trying to taper off social media, but I, uh, I'm on Instagram at Will the Finn. Um, okay. Uh, will the Finn and uh, at Instagram, and I think I'm on Facebook. Although I logged off many months ago, and I don't really go on very often. I applaud you for that. <laughs> it's um, <laughs> and I have a YouTube channel. I'll have to send you the URL for that. But I do have a YouTube Great. channel where I have a couple of old uh, tutorials I did, and I'm gearing up to do more stuff on it because awesome. uh, my older son is always telling me he's sick of hearing me tell these stories. He said, why don't you tell them online? <laughs> yes, that would be amazing. Please let us know, and we'll let everybody, uh, everybody, all of our listeners know about it as well. Right. And before you go, too, the, we were, we were uh, asking about that. It is correct that it, your blog, your blog uh, page is willfin.blogspot.com, and there's tons of great content on there. Um, I'm, I'm looking at one right now. Uh, you're right up on June four a. Oh yeah. Um, yeah. I think that was the last and, thing I did. That's gotta be yeah, a couple of years a, ago now. Right. Um, looks like July 29th, but it, I don't have a year here. 2017. Yeah. 2017. Yeah. There you go. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I, um, the problem is that it takes me so long to write and edit these things. I wish I had more time to do them. As you know, it, all, this kind of stuff takes so much more time than people think. And uh, it great credit to you guys that uh, you do this on a regular basis because I love podcasts. That's my new thing now. I love them. Okay. Well, Will, thank you so much. I really appreciate it. And um, hopefully we will talk again soon. Okay. Great. Thank you. You guys have a great All right, night. Will, take care.
All right, everybody. Thank you so much for listening to the Pencil Pushers podcast. Follow us on Instagram at the Pencil Pushers podcast for visual representation of our guest artwork, topics discussed, and anything else that contributes to the show. Be sure to subscribe. Tell a friend. Tell lots and lots of friends. Become a leadhead. And we're out.